All right, so it is just 12 o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Welcome to everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our 24th annual Elder Abuse Conference, Evolving Interventions and Resources. This conference is presented by Caring Transitions of Syracuse. My name is Lauren Ulrich, and I'm the Abuse and Later Life Prevention and Outreach Coordinator at Vera House. All webinars offered during this conference are free, thanks to the generous support of our sponsors. In addition to our presenting sponsor, this year we're fortunate to have three platinum sponsors. Loretto, Onondaga County Department of Adult and Long-Term Care Services, and Syracuse Jewish Family Service. I'd also like to acknowledge our gold sponsor, Wegmans, and our silver sponsors, At Home Independent Living, Busque Holstein PLLC, Christopher Community Incorporated, Community Bank, Countryside Federal Credit Union, Fulton Savings Bank, Geddes Federal Savings and Loan Association, the Marone Law Firm, and Touching Hearts at Home. And just as a reminder, more information about all of our sponsors can be found on the Vera House website at the virtual resource table link on our conference registration page. The support of these sponsors not only funds this webinar series, but also extends beyond the conference to continue vital elder abuse education, outreach, and prevention work after the event. We just have one final announcement before we begin today. Um, our chat feature has been disabled for this session, but you're welcome to submit questions via the Q&A feature. And I did just get a comment that it's a little difficult to hear me, um, so I'm moving my microphone a little closer, but I will not be speaking very much after this, so hopefully that will be resolved. So without further ado, we can get started with today's session, Issues in Palliative Care. It's my pleasure to introduce you all to today's speaker, Dr. Barbara Krenzer. Dr. Krenzer is the Medical Director of Palliative Care Services for Adult Advanced Illness at Upstate University Hospital. So now, Dr. Krenzer, I will be turning it over to you to introduce yourself, and I will get your PowerPoint pulled up to begin today's session. Thank you very much. Um, I'm an internist by trade for the last 34 years, so I do general internal medicine. And I've also worked since 2002 as the medical director of the adult palliative care service here at University, Upstate uh, Medical University. I see patients in the hospital setting, and also we have an ambulatory setting, an office setting. So I have both those experiences of being a general internist and seeing people now where these decisions are at the forefront and they're in the midst of serious illness. I appreciate being asked to speak today. I think that understanding the importance of having these discussions, uh, we have so many people that are especially elderly that may or may not have good spokespeople for them. Uh, their own wishes uh, need to be represented. And a lot of this takes preparation to prevent them from being um, lost in the medical profession or having inappropriate care that's not associated with what, who they were and what their wishes were. Um, next slide. Hopefully we can get next Sorry. Uh, slide. Sorry, That's Dr. Okay. Kenzer, it's being a little slow advancing on me. That's there okay. <laughs> so no problem. So we're gonna, these are some of the issues we're gonna do. We're gonna uh, define the difference between palliative care and hospice care. Those are common misconceptions. Go over advanced directives, including healthcare proxies, what's a surrogate decision maker, the MOLST form and how those directives can help, along with some legal terms of power of attorneys, living wills and wills. We're going to talk about capacity versus competency. Some of these are medical terms versus legal terms. And just have a better working knowledge, hopefully, of these by the end of the talk. Next slide. So we're all going through a journey in life, uh, moving forward always. And that anticipation or planning and thinking about what our values are remain important. And uh, those are what we need to uh, recognize and try to think about as best we can. We can't anticipate everything in the future. Next slide. And I think in overall for, for the individual, 
to have some peace of mind or the family member or friend that we can provide that type of support and advocacy for the person, uh, the patient. Next slide. So we have more and more people now that are elderly, that are living longer with serious illness. Life expectancies other than having gone through COVID have gone up year to year. And so there are more older people, but more of us are living with multiple illnesses. And so we're being maintained, but living with chronic illnesses. There are more frequent hospitalizations secondary to that and healthcare costs and utilization are high, particularly in the last year of life. Many times uh, because of lack of uh, clear directives, it's hard to know what's appropriate and uh, aggressive and that may be inappropriate care can happen. As you're elderly, people may need a spokesperson. They may not have capacity to make all decisions. And a healthcare proxy or a medical, a surrogate decision maker, those are terms we use in New York State, come into play at those times, or the medical illness itself can change capacity. We're a nuclear society now where people many times now are farther away from extended family. Uh, they live alone and are more uh, socially vulnerable. And how do we know the wishes of those people? And also people are more likely now to die away from home in an institution, be it skilled nursing or hospice, a hospital setting. Next slide. You may say, are we victims of our own success of living longer, that people have chronic illness associated with it, um, and what's quality and what's important? Uh, I've heard said that it's doing the trying to figure out what's the right thing for that person at that point in their life. So what might be right at one stage in our life may no longer be the same goal or the same appropriate therapy. Next slide. The number of people over 85 will double to 10 million by the year 2030. And 23% of Medicare patients have over four chronic conditions uh, simultaneous that, you know, again, living with chronic illness. And that accounts for almost 70% of Medicare spending. Next slide. This is kind of our traditional thought of care, um, which probably does not really represent uh, what's going on, that whatever disease you have, you're getting totally cured of care, that there's no other way to look at it. And then you, you jump over a fence or a hurdle and it becomes hospice care and then death. That it's all or none, the directive of care. Next slide. For most of us, this actually is the truth and helps you think about palliative care in this setting and life in general. That if you go to the left side, that you start with preventative care and as you get older, prevention increases over time. A serious diagnosis then occurs. Let's take a cancer diagnosis, perhaps a stage four cancer. You're, you're looking at curative life prolonging care, that green, and there may be some symptom management associated with the disease or the therapy of the disease. But as time goes on, the disease progresses. We're hopefully staying it off for a while, but more and more of medical care gets focused on symptom management, living with the disease, and the hopes for curative go down and the, the choices we have to give curative. As you progress further, discussions on end of life, life closure, and then the active process of dying. So you can see hospice is in that end period and also includes after death bereavement support for the family. And hospice is one piece of that entire continuum of palliation with the chronic illness. Next slide. And uh, keep going, uh, just keep clicking. So it's a comprehensive specialized care. Many times it's interdisciplinary. So you could have um, physician, nurse practitioner, social worker, case manager um, that are giving different levels of the type of care. Um, spiritual care would be another person, but we're focusing on alleviating suffering. The word palliate, palliate 
from Latin is to cloak. So you're trying to encompass the patient and the family unit, focusing on all the stresses that occur with this illness and focusing on quality. Next slide. Uh, Dame Cicely Saunders uh, talked about total suffering. She was the person who really started the hospice movement in the 1970s in England. And there are all these different uh, portions of suffering that together compromise or uh, define total suffering. Next slide. These are thoughts, at least we tell physicians and medical people to think about, but I think we all know patients like this and family members. When you uh, think about palliative care in a person who, who no longer has a curative option, they may have a life limiting illness and there's no longer life prolonging therapy, an unacceptable level of pain, uncontrolled symptoms, psychological or spiritual issues. If they're ending up bouncing in and out of the ER for the same diagnosis or multiple hospitalizations, a prolonged stay in the hospital without starting to regain health, and the same with a long intensive care unit admission without evidence of improvement. Um, if there's a poor or futile prognosis, we can come in at all levels of care um, but when we talk, we'll talk further about advanced directives, it can even precede the palliative care consult. And these advanced directives can be talked about with your primary care, with your specialist if it's heart failure or your oncologist if it's cancer, et cetera. Next slide. So again, we can do symptom and pain control. It's important to reflect on values of a patient, goals of care, promote advanced care planning, help with communication challenges, and talk about transitions. We know different uh, levels of care that people need and when it may be appropriate to think about moving towards hospice, et cetera. Uh, we're used to working with multiple other teams to coordinate information, um, but our job is to, again, um, to call, help the person and the family, and that we do acknowledge that death and dying are part of a normal process. It's funny that doctors and medical people hate to use the term palliative care. And they even say, why don't you change the name of your service? Because we're so afraid to talk about death. Um, there's some feeling of failure. And when we come to introduce ourselves to a patient, instead of saying that I'm from palliative care, um, they may not know what it is or misconstrue us at hospice and end of life. I like to say I'm from a support team, doctors, nurse practitioners, social workers that are here to support you, to advocate for you as you're coping with this long-term illness and to help your family. And if they say that's reasonable, we do say, and our name is palliative care, but we give some context to it. And I think when you're talking to family members or counseling someone who's in the hospital, that may be a way to look at as additional support. Next slide. So again, supportive care. Um, again, we do many of the advanced directive documents also, though they can be done in many places. Uh, after this difficult year with COVID, we really many times um, were the uh, people helping with the, uh, the phone calls to families and, and friends at home when the patients could not do that with COVID and they could not visit that that daily interaction and exchange of information could be a huge support, both for the patient and for the family, that they were aware that a conversation was happening when people felt so isolated. So many times we were just another layer of communication. Next. Now there's, we talked about this big umbrella of palliative care, but hospice care is a subset of palliative care. It is when you are in your land, it is a Medicare benefit. Um, many other insurances also offer it. It's really at the time when you're not looking at, the goal moves from prolongation of life more to talking about instead of number of days, the quality of the life that you're in. That it's, it's accepting that change and acknowledging that the therapies for prolongation are not beneficial. 
it is not about dying as much as quality of the time you have for the time that you live. Um, for heart failure, I give an example there. So it's comfort and support, whatever the long-term illness is, but it has to be someone whose prognosis is less than six months. Can I get hospice if I live longer than six months? Yes, but I'd have to be recertified. Um, doctors, it can be provided in multiple places, home, hospice homes like Francis House or Matthew's House or skilled nursing. It is uh, an avenue to have, I'll describe what they can do at home. They can send a, a nurse to the house at least once a week. You can have an aide a couple hours a day at the maximum um, if they're available, provides all equipment, all medications. And then 24, the big uh, pro of it is 24 seven availability to reach your nurse or the covering nurse and their ability to come to the home if there are changes. So, but the, at home, it's the family supporting places like Francis House or skilled nursing home when the family can't provide that custodial, that nursing care, they provide that and hospice still comes into those facilities to do the oversight, the symptom management and to provide the support, emotional support um, to the family and the patient. Next slide. And click twice, please. So there's that palliative care is the large group and the subset in this Venn diagram is hospice care. So they are one in the same in some ways, but palliation comes earlier and discussions of advanced directives come much earlier than at end of life as that diagram of your, your lifespan showed at the beginning. Next slide. New York state laws are interesting related to this. The Family Healthcare Decision Act was important uh, in 2010. It helped when people did not have health care proxies on who the decision maker would be. And that person's called a surrogate decision maker. It was also able to allow significant others, if you were living together, to have a hot in the hierarchy be, to be able to serve as the surrogate decision maker when a patient has no one listed. And we'll go over the order of that. The Palliative Care Information Act the same year, this is a sad statement of medical care that New York State actually created a law that said, if your prognosis is six months or less, you, the provider, the physician or nurse practitioner or physician assistant must notify you of that. And you must uh, be told that and be offered the choice of hospice or palliation. And there was a $5,000 fine I don't think that's ever been enforced, but the fact that they felt that we do such a bad job that they had to write a law. And certainly there's a lot of gray zone for what six months. When I try to teach uh, doctors and residents about this, and it really, you should think about, and when you're thinking about people you may be working with, you know, what's six months, that's the gray area. And doctors are, are very um, optimistic that we, studies have shown we al always overestimate prognosis or, or have a high tendency to do that. My favorite question instead is to say, would I be surprised if this person died in the next six months? Let's say they've been in and out of the hospital frequently with their dementia, they've had some aspiration pneumonias, they may have fallen intermittently. Would I be surprised? And if in fact I can say, no, I wouldn't be surprised, I should think about hospice therapy besides thinking about advanced directives, but that's getting late in their illness. But just to be aware that, gee, our state even created a law because we don't do this well. Next slide. So here's some advanced directives that I think I actually, as an internist would tell all my patients about healthcare proxies 18 and over. And they, my 80 year old would say, gee, why are you asking me this? Are you worried about me? Where in fact, I say, no, no, it's my standard. I always ask this. I want to have your backup person, but healthcare proxy forms, living wills, MOLTS, which are medical orders of life sustaining treatment. Others can be legal power of attorney or a will. All of these, depending on someone's illnesses may make sense. Um, 
And when I go over the surrogate order, sometimes this helps reinforce why you might want to do a healthcare proxy. But these, uh, the first four, three are things that your physician can do with you in the office. Healthcare proxies and living wills can also be filled out at home, and those forms are available online. But our very important backups, and like wills, are um, the newest one is the legal one. Um, they tried to make the law as user friendly for healthcare proxies so that people would complete them. And I think we have a lot of vulnerable people, and um, to know who they trust the most for their healthcare proxy is important. Next slide. So healthcare proxy, again, I talk to patients and say, who do you trust? Who's your backup person? Who knows your wishes? Um, and that usually is the easiest way to think about it. Now, a healthcare proxy doesn't help if you have, you should, unless you've talked to them also about your wishes so that they're aware in some generalities, what's important to you, your thoughts about what, to, you know, what living environment, what degree of health you would think uh, were, were the goals, et cetera, so that they can make that decision. Um, let's go to a form, next slide. So filling out a healthcare proxy, this is upstate's version of New York State, but you can appoint a primary person as you see and an alternate. Um, you can put an expiration date. Some people do that if a family member's traveling and they want to appoint a healthcare proxy short term, but many times I see it open-ended. We go to the next slide, page two. So the person signs it and then you need two witnesses. Now, the witness cannot be the person you chose as the healthcare proxy. And that sometimes, um, that could make it uh, not a legal form. So you need two uh, people other than the healthcare proxies you chose to witness, and that becomes a legal form. It does no good sitting in a drawer at home. It really needs to be disseminated. The proxies need a copy. Your doctors should have a copy. As we become electronic medical records, excellent to be in that setting because even when you go to the ER, it gets pulled out. Um, they are working on ways for institutions to share their advanced directives more easily. Um, St. Joseph's and Upstate are both in the EPIC system. Um, it all depends on electronic records, but at least it's in a place that can be pulled easily. And these are, I always look at valuable information and most electronic medical records have a particular place to put the advanced directives. So when you come to the ER, it can be pulled up. The family should have it at home also. Next slide. The MOLST or POLST, depending on your state, the MOLST is what New York State has, and ours is bright, deep, fluorescent pink, because there aren't any forms I can think of that color. The POLST, uh, again, states call them either or. 46 of the 50 states have these right now. And they go beyond, we'll look at one, just the question of do not resuscitate or not. They add additional choices if the patient has absolute you know, black and white decisions on them. They go at it. The MOLST goes uh, next to the front door inside with a thumbtack, the ambulance comes in to see, or on the refrigerator. And actually, now people doing these usually have serious illness. If you travel, it needs to be with you. That sounds kind of crazy, but I have patients who have a plastic clear sheet. It goes on their refrigerator. They have their healthcare proxy, their MOLST their list of doctors, their list of meds. So it's something to consider, but that's where it needs to be. So many of my patients say, oh, I don't like to look at it on the refrigerator or I have it in the special drawer. You know, when the ambulance comes in, if they do not see it, no matter what the family says, it must be performed. The most are actual doctor's orders. So let's look at one. Oh, I'm gonna go back for a minute. I apologize. We'll come back to one in a minute. So you're fine, go to the next slide, you're fine. So I talked about healthcare proxy. Sometimes these three terms uh, get exchanged by patients or by families, they're confused. A uh, family member comes in, the patient doesn't uh, have the ability to speak themselves to a point. And a family member says, well, I'm the healthcare proxy. And instead they're the power of attorney, which is to make financial 
you know, interactions for the patient. Um, unless I have a form and I have a correct form, I have to go instead to surrogate decision maker to make medical decisions. So it's so important we capture that healthcare proxy as an outpatient, um, when they first come to the hospital in the emergency room, when before they've had delirium or go to the ICU or get sicker with their pneumonia, et cetera, if I can capture who that important person or persons are. And again, I, otherwise I have to have the form and we try to obtain those from the primary cares, from their lawyers, uh, family members may bring them in, but it's really hearsay to accept that you're the healthcare proxy without a form. So we always go instead with the surrogate decision maker. And that's the legal term from that Healthcare Decision Act of what it's the order of decision makers. Let's go to the next slide. Again, I'm talking about capacity versus competency. Capacity is a medical term. It's question specific. I may with my deme early dementia have capacity to pick my healthcare proxy. I know who I trust. I'm not really certain about my heart disease. I don't have much insight to it. I, I don't understand it. So I may not have capacity for more complicated medical uh, decisions. Capacity is global. It's decided by a judge. Um, we use the term capacity and we list in the medical world what question it's to. Next slide. I talked about surrogate decision makers. This is where things get messy. So we're gonna go over this a little bit. First, it's a legal guardian. And occasionally people have legal guardians appointed by the court. But the most common when we're trying to figure this out is spouse or domestic partner comes first if you don't have a healthcare proxy and you don't have capacity to pick one or to make medical decisions. Now. In the real world, we have people with both. So they've not divorced or legally separated and they're living with someone else. The spouse actually becomes the decision maker. Messy. Um, and they can bar the domestic partner from the bedside. So very frustrating, um, confusing. Many of these things are recognized for years ahead. And I'm always surprised how many patients are uh, seen by the medical profession for a long time, yet no one got had this healthcare proxy figured, you know, done to get away from this situation. I had a patient, she and her husband were divorcing, and they were really very mature. They immediately did new healthcare proxies and brought them in. Uh, he was a divorce lawyer. Um, this was an amicable late divorce. And she in uh, three weeks had a head trauma in Florida. And they were able, I had the new healthcare proxy. She had an uh, inhaler in her pocket when she was hit by a car and had a head trauma. And we could fax everything to Florida. They had all the new connections. It was the children. And it really just was a huge relief. And, and she actually did very well, but it really showed to me how having all those numbers and being prepared, it happened during a physical uh, that they were updating things. And that was so useful. The next, if you don't have a spouse or domestic partner would be adult child, actually all adult child children, 18 and over. You can imagine people have complicated stories and to have all the children agree can be difficult. To find all the children can be difficult. And some may have different opinions of what happens. That it does not stand different, the child who's very involved versus the child who's, who's left the family, they all stand equal legally. So you get into a lot of uh, issues of um, disharmony uh, and uh, disagreements that distract from the importance of the decisions for the patient. We recently had a case where there were nine children with a couple, uh, couple different uh, sets of fathers and uh, the, fa uh, the husband of the patient was reportedly deceased. And the nine children actually all came to agreement. Uh, she had had a large stroke to go to comfort. And about three days into it, it was revealed that actually the husband was alive and was in jail. And that they didn't really like him much. He was uh, the father just of the few of the children. So we had to go backwards and uh, find this 
husband. And actually he disagreed with the children initially, but we had a large um, telephone conference where they could all talk and they came then to consensus. But you can see again how these issues, and this lady had been in medical care for a long time. No one asked or obtained a healthcare proxy from her. I always think if I explain this to a patient and they realize these orders, it would be, they may be welcome hit appointing someone. I had a patient who had 10 children and she thought for years, oh no, they'll feel that I'm making one the special child. So I won't appoint. And only when she was getting admitted in heart failure, we almost, we laughed actually with each other because we had talked about it so much in the ER because she finally appointed someone. She kept her capacity, never needed it. So if you don't have children, then it goes to both parents. Again, it does not matter if one has abandoned you. Uh, they have the right to both be involved. And then brothers and sisters. And if you have no one, a close friend could uh, be your health, your uh, surrogate decision maker. So you see that this is a complicated process, open to disagreements and disharmony. And um, can be helpful. Any of these people can choose not to participate, um, even if you were named a healthcare proxy and the person never talked to you, you have the right to um, abstain. Uh, I had a woman who had six children, three were with uh, an initial marriage in Florida and she abandoned that family as a young woman, moved to Syracuse, had three more children. Uh, husband had died at that point, and there were six children. They all stood equal. They were all half siblings, and they knew each other enough, not much, but enough. And the three in Florida I had to call, and they all abstained. They, they knew they had equal rights and abstained. And then the three in New York State uh, came to decisions on her uh, goals of care. So again, um, I always wonder why we haven't done these sooner and such important discussions. Next slide. Dr. Kunzer, before we move on, I wanted to let you know that we have a great question in the chat that I was wondering if you might want to address before we go forward. Um, one of our participants asked, what if the person in a position of responsibility, so I guess whether that's a healthcare proxy or in another role, what if the responsible person is known to be abusive or exploiting the individual? That's very hard to remove a person. And that's a good question. Um, we also, I could also throw, throw in the scenario where the person, the surrogate or the healthcare proxy may have dementia or might have psychiatric illness and may not be um, able to carry out that job. We would have to, we can ask the person to abstain or that they're overwhelmed. But if they do not, and we're concerned about abuse, we have had those issues in our hospital. We actually have to get legal involved, and we usually would have to go to court to remove a decision maker. That we ourselves cannot remove a decision maker. We can ask them to abstain, but if we're concerned, like adult protectives involved, et cetera, because we have all those issues, or they may even be you know, the cause of the injury, we usually have to have our legal team involved and we may have to go in front of a judge to get a guardian or to go to the next uh, person in, in the decision tree. So it's, we cannot unilaterally make those decisions. So that puts us at quandary. We bring those up to social work as soon as possible. And it may force us short term to have that person in the role as we're also advocating for them through the courts. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, I do find with capacity issues, if it's an elderly spouse, um, acknowledging to them this must be difficult. Would you like the children also involved? Would you like a family meeting? Um, how can we help support you? Would you like to stand back and let the next people in line if there's a secondary proxy or if there's the children as the next in the Family Decision Act to, you know, would that be helpful to them? Next slide. So this is just the MOLTS, and on the left side, it talks about doing um, decisions simply on if your heart stopped, if you stopped breathing, would you want an attempt at cardiac resuscitation, CPR? 
Um, again, for a doctor to ask these questions to the patient, they'd have to have the capacity to understand their medical condition. I may be going to the surrogate decision maker or the um, guardian or the healthcare proxy instead. Um, on the right side, the additional things that the MOLTS brings out can be, is there no limitation in care? Are there some limitations such as I wouldn't want to be on a ventilator or I wouldn't want a feeding tube? Or am I truly in that hospice area of comfort measures only and all care is focused on comfort? Feelings on intubation, short-term, long-term, or not to attempt. Future hospitalizations, I think that's important. Um, I, an example would be I have a patient with stage four cancer. They're too ill. Their functional ability is so poor. They, they can no longer get chemo. If they improve, they might reconsider again, palliative chemo, patients sometimes go to rehabilitation to, if the patient wants that option. And so we're really clear with them. Do you, if you go to rehab and you can't get rehab, do you want to come back to the hospital or not? So some patients will say, I want, my goal is to try to rehab, to maybe get further chemo. And if I fail, I'll revert to, I'll go then to hospice. So you can even put in, if their feelings, I don't want to come back to the hospital anymore or not. That can be there to stop that reflexive middle of the night, return to the hospital in the, from the skilled nursing facility. Artificial nutrition and hydration, antibiotics, other instructions, some people put in dialysis, but these are all absolutes. Um, again, uh, we witness those and depending on the decision maker. A big mistake I see in the medical profession and something that I think we should be counseling these people that are the decision makers, if they're representing someone else's, I feel these are very strongly, these are not a living will, they're not to be interpreted. These are absolutes. I felt strong enough, I sat with my doctor, if the patients made these decisions and said, I don't wanna be resuscitated and I don't want my life prolonged on a ventilator, too many times we question it and say, um, I know your mom said she didn't want these things done, but if, you know, with her pneumonia, she's coming in, you know, if I don't do this, she's going to die. So I know she made these decisions, but what do you want to do? And I think the job, I'll, I'll tell you the job of the circuit decision maker or the healthcare proxy, their first and foremost job is to do the known wishes of the patient. What's more clear than a MOLTS filled out? These are and a doctor's order. These are a doctor's order in New York State to be honored anywhere in New York State. This is clear known wishes to add to. We shouldn't question that and, and give that option to the healthcare proxy. We should say, you know, now your mother's already made some absolute decisions. She's already decided not to be intubated and not to have an attempt at resuscitation. So I'm asking you now as her, her decision maker, in that setting where we're not gonna to escalate to the ICU, um, I can try antibiotics, I can try oxygen. I'm really worried that she won't survive. I, I think ethically I'd like to add comfort measures in case she gets very short of breath. I think you should come in. I think you should be with your mother. You should tell your families this next 24, 48 hours are important. Or do you wanna move completely to comfort at this time depending on her other health statuses? So these stand and too many times you'll see confusion and questioning when a patient felt so strongly to do these. So I, I uh, strongly advocate these should be honored. These are uh, absolute written instructions. Sometimes I'll add the patient hasn't done this and the decision maker is stuck. Okay, so I don't, they may have still talked about it and I've been at family meetings where uh, they say, I can hear my mother speaking, this is what she wants. Um, but other times the patient may be frightened, never talked about it. And in those settings, then you're with um, what can you best interpret from perhaps other family experiences, any implied uh, wishes. If you have none of that, then you make a decision just like you make for your own health, benefit and burden. Next slide. A living will is kind of this idea. So I, maybe I don't feel absolute with the MOLTS form, but there, in the outpatient world, when I'm talking to a patient, um, they may say, and this is like the important piece for the healthcare proxy, um, 
if I was going to be a vegetable, if I'm going to be on long-term machines, I don't want to be resuscitated. Well, that's not a black and white decision. That's in a particular context. And that living will can be a document that helps guide, I think of it as a letter guiding the healthcare proxy or the surrogate decision maker on your wishes. Next slide. So here's an example of one where in this case, if I'm permanently unconscious or a terminal condition or a minimally com conscious condition where I'm unable to make decisions more for comfort measures. Next slide. And again, you can have witnesses, but that's really a letter that a lot of patients bring that in and they think they have a DNR, DNI, and they don't. They have instructions to their decision maker. I've seen Jehovah's Witnesses, and they even include um, uh, blood products and what they can and can't have. My, help, my living will could say, do everything, never stop. So there are letters of intent that have to be interpreted. We had a patient who told her niece she had bad heart failure. You can put me in intensive care. You can put me on a ventilator for seven days. After seven, you can do CPR, all that for seven days. If I'm not better, not out of the ICU, pull the plug. So this poor niece inherits that prerogative. She comes in and heart failure goes in the ICU and then goes into renal failure also and needs emergent dialysis. And the niece struggled. She, she didn't say anything about dialysis. Interpreted, you know, she gave you this directive, really do everything for the first seven days, which she then did, but the, the uh, patient did not improve and then went to comfort care. Next slide. A will obviously is, is uh, more associated with financial issues after death. Now, what's important is that people um, realize that the uh, power of attorney and the healthcare proxy end at death. So they end at death and then like the executor of the will comes out. And when we ask for autopsies, we don't go to the healthcare proxy, we have to go to the next of kin. So those are all when you're living. And that can be somewhat of a confusing thing, even for medical professionals. And I know that people run to the bank the day the person dies, uh, that are power of attorney to quick get money for funerals before things go to estates. But just that we're aware that they end at death. Next. So power of attorney, again, reasonable. Let's say you think you're going to be in and out of the hospital. You know, if you give it, you might have a business running, et cetera, or just that the family stays a float, many people with serious illness get powers of attorney. And that can be used even while you have capacity. Next. The most we've talked about, next. And again, these are some of the decisions. Next. Oh, and, and next, sorry, I'm repeating here. So these are just some languages when we're talking to people. Some of this, I think, uh, when we're talking to people, we give, uh, we, we're too directive. So, you know, when you talk about doing everything or discontinuing care, that uh, are all, that's certainly going to direct someone. And I like to stay, say instead, perhaps that the disease no longer is curable. And all this, these efforts, including perhaps a long hospital stay, we've tried to regain health and you haven't been able to achieve that. Should we at this point, refocus on aggressive treatment of quality of life and of symptoms. Patients do not want to be abandoned. And our words like, there's nothing else I can do. Do you want to discontinue care? Don't you want us to do everything? Those can all um, not necessarily offer hope. Sometimes we have to rephrase hope because we all are going to die and it may not be a curative situation, but we can rephrase it. Um, pulling back can be difficult. Again, I like to say we're going to still aggressively treat you, but it's going to be focused on comfort. Next. So again, many times in the hospital, we, we have conversations that pull in family. Many decision makers want other decision makers involved. I have a case now where the daughter's the healthcare proxy. There's multiple other siblings, although they're not the proxy. She wants to do right for her father who's failing in our ICU and, and likely uh, need, will not survive. And she's probably made the decision, but needs to be certain her siblings are on the same page. Because we're talking about the family's health through the death and maintaining as a family unit 
afterwards and to allow them to catch up and, and feel like they've been heard also. So many healthcare proxies feel like they're really, they'll involve additional people. Next. I think though it's important in that last slide is that that woman's in the center of the conversation. And many times we do go through forks in the road. Sometimes patients need to decide the direction, but I like to say sometimes the disease pushes you in a decision or not, that you haven't responded to therapy, that situation I talked about with cancer and going to rehab. And despite your efforts at rehab, um, you've not been able to gain strength. The cancer hasn't allowed it. The disease hasn't allowed it. It may push you in one direction in the road. Next. Language to talk about goals of care that, you know, I'm going to focus on your symptoms. You know, what can we still uh, fulfill? Can we keep you at home? Uh, what can, you know, I feel empowered as a palliative care doctor. I can do something today to problem solve with you to see if we can do good care at home and how we could keep them comfortable. Next. And, and the fact of, again, not being abandoned. My uncle had pancreatic cancer in Washington, D.C. at 70. When he, after his first course, when he decided to stop chemotherapy, his oncologist came in the next day, shook his hand, said you made the right decision and fired him. Even though the oncologist would have been the expert in treating end of life with uh, pancreatic cancer. So I was very unhappy with that. And that idea of, unless you take treatment, I, you know, a doctor takes care of you too you know, with the disease, no matter what treatment choices you have. Um, so I think that's as, as medical professionals, what we want and what your family member, your patient deserves, um, and that you still are priority throughout. Next. So what can we still do at end of life? Next. You know, uh, just shows how important and people are talking about these things throughout. Next. And again, trying to keep the patient at, at in the priority and to have that time with the patient in whatever setting. Next. Lots of physical symptoms we can treat um, and we have good therapies. Um, and this is uh, part of the training I have with palliative care. And my job is to disseminate this knowledge to primary care doctors. To, uh, there's, there's primary palliative care, which all physicians should be able to do. And then secondary when you need a specialist, almost like the fact that many doctors treat diabetes, primary care, but you need an endocrinologist. So there's different levels of palliation. Next. We talked about legally getting things in order next. Many economic burdens were helping with um, family leave forms. I think the economic strain is the most important. And I find doctors many times don't realize how little insurance pays for end of life care, that it, unless you have Medicaid, you're not getting paid for that custodial care on top of the hospice piece, the actual nursing home care and the burdens of that. Is this person carrying the insurance for the family or is the caretaker losing their job and not having insurance or the economic burden of that? Next. Next slide. Economy and trying to keep the patient heard and listened to is extremely important. Um, and to incorporate that into the decisions that are being made. Next. Next, are there things that still need to be resolved at end of life and things we can still talk about with patients um, and what's important still to them um, that gives us, sometimes I feel like we don't know what to say when someone's going through these. And these are many open-ended things that we can still talk about and families can talk about that help people um, and this is many things that hospice does also with patients. Next. 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 Obviously lots of uh, other symptoms come to play here. Next. So hopefully at the end of this, I'm, I'm just a big advocate that we need to 
Um, our elderly is a large group of people I deal with, though these illnesses can be at any age. I think all of us want to preserve our autonomy. We want to preserve our wishes. We have certain values of what's important for quality of life for us. One person's value can be different from another. Um, I always try to remind the residents, if a patient, if the patient says what I want, I tend to think, oh yes, they have capacity. But if their decisions are different than my own personal, I may question their capacity, that I have to stay open, open-minded um, and to listen to patients and their families, but to empower them and to document as much as possible for the future so that the right thing happens. Next. These are some other uh, discussion things that you can think about and who else can support the family, including spiritual care. Next. So a physician in the 16th century, to cure sometimes, to relieve often, to comfort always. And I think that's the way to look at uh, the medical profession and people caring for people through these chronic illnesses. Next. And next. These are some um, references I have. Uh, this book, Heart Choices for Loving People, I cannot recommend enough. It has different chapters on uh, different points, including feeding tubes, uh, resuscitation, ventilators, and moving towards from aggressive care to comfort measures. Um, it's not, uh, it was written by a hospital chaplain who said someone's got to write a book because no matter how many meetings I have, it's overwhelming to patients. And there's something about reading and rereading that can help. Even after death with bereavement for the family, this book can be a big support on decisions they made in the past. These are some other good uh, websites to be able to get these forms and to talk about some of these decisions. So I thank you very much. And I appreciate talking today. Thank you so much, Dr. Krenza. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise. I know this is a lot of really useful, useful information for a lot of us. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat, and I do think that we have some time to address them. Um, one participant is asking if we could make the PowerPoint of today's presentation available. With your permission, I can get that sent out to everyone after today's session, if that's okay That's absolutely uh, fine. I welcome that. Great, great. We're getting lots of positive feedback as well. So thank you again for your time today, Dr. Penzer. Um, another question we have is, what if a healthcare proxy makes a decision due to the cost of treatment when it is not in the best interest of the patient? In particular, in cases of financial exploitation, many family care providers are taking advantage of the older adult and make decisions for their best interest, so to maintain more funds versus the best interest of the patient. Very hard, and we do see that. And we question it. Um, an example would be the, you know, if you apply for Medicaid, the house gets turned over to New York State. But if a spouse lives in the house, they can remain till their death. But a son, a significant other, you know, someone else uh, has to leave. So we wonder sometimes with that, is that affecting decisions? It's very hard um, to judge. Uh, another case we had. Um, this was very black and white where the, the son had, had caused a, a, a life-threatening brain injury to the father had, and went to jail. Yet the decision maker, the wife, the mother of this son, if she did comfort measures and allowed him to die, her son would be up for murder. Ugh, there's no win in some of those. Um, we can try to explore it. It's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult to remove a decision maker. Um, we do reach out to adult protective and get our legal involved in some of these unusual ones, but many of them, you are unable to question that decision maker. Um, and that's very difficult. And that's why I think we have to get good decision makers to start with. That when we're finding these abusive um, situations prior to end of life, we have to try to change those decision makers and document healthcare proxies before we're in the heat of the moment, that these are very hard legal things to change and to get support, et cetera. 
So, and, and maybe if, I don't know if someone's on from adult protective, but I think once they're in the hospital, adult protective's happy that they're being taken care of and that they're in a safe environment, but the financial piece is hard. So I think our job is prior to the hospital stay to try to get the person to have a trustworthy decision maker. Not a simple answer. I don't have an absolute answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Kenzer. Um, we haven't had any other questions come into the chat, so maybe I'll give it a few more beats, and then if we don't get any other questions, we can conclude for the day. But I really appreciate you taking the time to answer these questions. I think it's it's just as you say that these are very very complex issues with no easy answers, but your perspective is just so incredibly informative. Um, so thank you so much. Certainly. I will let you know that Kraus, uh, St. Joseph's, Upstate, Community, um, all have palliative care services to, and to try to help. And Upstate has a pediatric palliative care service, that this is becoming more of a standard of care to try to support in these difficult um, situations. Thank you. Well, I'm not seeing any new questions come into our Q&A, so I think we can um, maybe conclude for the day. But again, thank you so much for taking the time with us today to share just your vast knowledge and expertise regarding this really critical issue. And for everyone on, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.